All right. All right. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. Today, today is the 17th of January, January and, and we're, we're here at the Raider Tuesday night uh, Builders Night Virtual, Dallas Personal Robotics Group. And uh, we'll, we'll do what we normally do, just go around the table and talk about real life things, builds, questions, um, things loosely related to real life builds and builds and technologies, processes behind that. Uh, we don't have much of a queue tonight, so. Uh, the team will need to just kind of ad lib here and uh, bring, bring up some topics to come to mind and, and let, let it go from there. So, uh, the first and, and the only person really I have in the queue tonight, tonight is Scott, who has a question for the next contest. So, uh, normally those questions are handled by Doug, uh, but I would ask if uh, Scott, if you want to raise it on the video here, then those of us that were on the call. Uh, a week or two ago, when we had Doug on as well and talked about it, maybe we, we could try and answer the question. So, uh, and then after, after that, that, I'll just be open mic. So, uh, I'm going to try and back out a little bit. Like I said earlier, I got stuff I've got to take care of. Um, Scott, can you go ahead and raise your question? Let's see where it goes. Uh, well, I, you know, I just wanted to find out what the schedule was, if the date's been set yet. Um, you know, typically we have the, you know, the can can or, or the six can contest um and you know i was thinking the other day when i was out in my shop that um you know our, our six can course the walls if you will are um you know when we were taking them apart and putting them back together you know they're kind of falling apart these days and i was offering up to, to build a new course for us um you know kind of falling in line with what, what the next uh, indoor contest was um so i just wanted to kind of throw that out there to i guess you the president and doug like you said he does most of the, the contest stuff um so you know like i said I, I wanted to find out that'd be all right with you guys um what the date might be um like i said i've been working on this other robot and kind of in the background um just playing around with the software on these nucleos and the, the sts it's, it's um i've been really kind of working my way through the data sheet trying to understand all the registers in this thing and the configurations so there's doug now i, I was asking about the, the next indoor contest doug um whether or not we we have a date um i also have an idea to to build a new um can can course because the walls of the one we have are kind of coming apart um and, and you know the, the top rails i have an idea to make one with hinges that kind of folds up into just four pieces um so that, that was kind of my proposal if you will but i wanted to get your feedback on you know what the dates might be um if we've set dates yet what you know typically we have a can can or a uh six can contest so i just wanted to find out if y'all made any decisions it's been a while since i've been on the call so just wanted to get an update where we're at with that so i've, I've, uh, put, I've put a, a link, link to the, to the chat, chat from it was only i guess a week ago last tuesday, tuesday night we talked about, about it. it and you can you follow, can follow the discussion then there, there. um so i guess you're online we're not hearing anything if you're talking but uh Basically, Basically, we're talking about, about the second, second week, week of May, if I understand, in the regular, in the regular meeting. meeting. And, and uh, 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 I think there's, I think there's a open, open, we're so far, we're so far enough in the future, future there's an open table if you want to do some different contest, contest proposals, proposals ideas, ideas or something. Or something. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, the, I believe that the only ones that uh, people really wanted to go for uh, was six cans, four corner, and beginner and advanced line following. Those were the only course. Right, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's for the only three that people said, okay, I, we got somebody who would be interested in doing it. Okay. And uh, the we went through all of the, the existing contests. And, you know, Scott, if you wanted to do something a little different, if you saw one, you can go, you know, go to the competition rules page and you can look at what's down there. And if you got an idea for a new one, let us know and we might come up with. 
So you want to, you're talking about making a new, a new course, you know, are you, you know, are you going to need a, like some people to come over and help you or how do you want to do it? No, I mean, uh, you know, if, if the, the club wants to pay for the supplies and that'd be okay with me. Yeah. Um, you know, some plywood and some, I was going to use some door hinges on the corners and basically have it where the, the ends fold up and then the two sides or five foot pieces kind of lock together yeah. and take apart. So you basically fold this thing up into, you know, four pieces plus the, the rails that go across the top of the gold. Well, I will say this, we used uh, on the original course, we used the, I think it's, it's not eighth inch and it's not quarter. I think it's three millimeters. So that'd be, yeah, that'd be pretty, thin, pretty thin walls. And the reason was for weight. You know, you want it. We also have, if you remember the big, what is the tabletop, the big yeah. tabletop. And that one weighs a ton. You know, I, I mean, because we're there at makerspace, it's not a big problem. But, you know, we don't know where we'll be in the future. So it's nice to have something that's uh, uh, like. Yeah, portable. Yeah, portable. Because, yeah, you know, we also use that uh, sometimes for public demonstrations. We still have half of it going or something like that. Oh, thank you, sweetie. Yeah, that would actually be uh, something you might think about. Uh, no tip there. Is if you made it with hinge sides, you know, there'd be five feet by five feet. To you might want to flip the have them so they they could flip sidewards, so that you have half a course. You see what I'm saying? Only one goal, but a half a course might make it nice for demonstrations. We've used Ray set up occasionally in the past. He has something like that, which he practices on. Uh, that, that doesn't matter. Just whatever is easy. That's the thing. Easy is, is good. Easy and light is good, you know, and not too expensive, you know. You know yeah, cut no, cut mean, down a little bit on the gold trim, you know. <laughs> no, no gold plating? No gold plating, yeah. So... Hey, maybe uh, we could uh, modify you know, it to add like April tags or something like that, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just flat. No, really? no, no. We, we, uh, we can. If you want to create the rules, Ray, or have an idea, or even if you don't want to create the rules, but just want to come up with an idea of something that that uses beacons, and that's fine. We can, we can come up and uh, write down something and see about formalizing it. Okay. I, I don't mind. Yeah, Ray, it's it's all about following the rules, Ray. <laughs> oh god, yeah. But I mean, rules are boring. Yeah. Well, the trick is the, yet? the trick is to be make rules that can can uh, evolve. Otherwise, mm -hmm. things that you know when you first run the court. I can remember the first time we did uh, six cans. No, actually, it was can can stalker. We didn't have that was before six cans. Six cans came later. We had a six can uh, in uh, at Perot Museum. Do you remember that one, Ray? Mm -hmm. I think it was. Uh, uh, it was a disaster. <laughs> it was pretty much a disaster, yeah. But it was. Uh, it was. Uh, God, who? I can't think of its name. What it called? Uh, tell me out. Delta. Delta Graphics. Ron. Okay, Ron. You know he had a robot, and. Uh, Green had a robot, and you know I had something that was slashed. I mean, it it had no no smarts at all. I I don't even know if it, it would direct towards the goal. It was just a robot, you know. And we went, and that was the that was the first running of that. So anyway, well, I like the uh, I don't know what they were twenty foot, thirty foot tall windows that you know. Oh yeah. Uh, sun, you know, shining brightly on the floor that it was on, and the Floor so was one like guy, so one guy was get, surface. Yeah, one guy was going into the sun, you know, and almost all his sensors were blind. And the other guy, he was, you know, there was no sun on his side, so he was cool. Until, until he got to the end and had to turn around and then poof, and everything goes yeah, away. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 
I remember the table. Yeah. That was really big on the tabletop. Tabletop mm -hmm. was because that one, uh, that one, oh, nobody censures worked on tabletop. We used to have the what they call wall following down there, and, and the course was actually like 15 foot. It was a cube, and it was like a T. Yeah. So it was 15 foot, and then eight foot, and whatever it was, and and you were supposed to follow the wall around, and I can remember people, you know, when they're in the shadow of the wall, they'd follow it just flying. And then when they turned around and they got in the sun, you know, it, everything went to hell on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we used to have a lot of a lot of problems with all the sun because it, it, it came right through there, you know, in the, the early afternoon when we were having all the contests. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah, it was it was definitely an issue. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, the one the one contest, um, you know, where our cans are orange and this little oriental girl shows up in this like orange jumper, you know, bright orange. And it's like right into the wall. Yeah. Uh, the, you remember the kid that had the orange sneakers the one yeah, year? Yeah, yeah, that was the one that got me. I had the orange sneaker one girl, yeah. you know, yeah. so like so what happened was my uh, when I went to the goal, you know, my thing was supposed I think. It was supposed to turn around, you know, to go back, get the next can. But if, if the sensor was left turned on when it made the turn, okay? And she was standing in the, in the back. So my, my robot, instead of turning around and going back into the thing, she just started following her as she, you know, and as it got close, you know, she kind of scampered back and they just, you know, honed in on her. <laughs> that was fun. But... Okay. Anyway, enough remin reminiscing. We need to yeah. go forward. Uh, Scott, uh, on using STM stuff, uh, you need to use the STM32 cube IDE. That will automatically set up any of the sensor, uh, any of the uh, IO registers you want. Well, they, they, they split that up. There's a MX now you go through, and it does the, the I.O. configuration and generates the, the I.O. configuration file for the project. So they I, I, I don't know how long ago they, they made that change, but I've seen some older projects and some older examples um, that, that don't, aren't set up that way. But that's how they're doing it now is they have the IDE on one side, and then they have the the MX and and that's where you graphically configure the pins and all that. But um, I thought I, they integrated I, that, yeah. uh, Scott. I believe it's integrated where it's, it's just one package. Like like yeah, like, I, I think it's it all packaged. Like Dave yeah. said, it's it's called the uh, it's called the Cube IDE. I might be Cube MX ID, and it's just one package and. I know that they had done that when it was back when it was, uh, uh, what was the name of that? The one that started with A that they bought out, but the one that became their product. Atrilis? No. At Atrio? No, I can't no. remember. The True, True Studio? Yeah, True Studio, whatever that was. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that when they bought, <laughs> they, we're still at that time they were playing about integrating them. They didn't come integrated, but you could integrate them. And I thought that now that it's all just, you know, when you open up your new project, it just slips you into MX, Cube MX so automatically and you set it up and then you flip over to the IDE part and it just works. That's what I thought. Yeah, you, that when you start at the MX level to configure mm -hmm. The I/O and the pen and you know the, the clock and all that, yeah. um, but and, and I've I've got that set up and I've got projects I'm playing with from that you know like the example projects, but I actually have a a plugin for Visual Studios that I use that does cross compilation and so you can call basically an external compiler, mm -hmm. um, so I'm using their um, their cross compiler and and actually they have a you know a real art real rtos or free rtos yeah. library and um you know netrino 
um, libraries and you can pull them in. Uh, yeah. You can actually import the MX prior, the IDE, you know, the cube projects directly into to Visual Studios. Um, and then I, I have a Sager or an ST link. Um, JTAG works on it too. So, yeah. um, you know, that would be, Scott, if you'd be interested in doing it, uh, using JTAG uh, would be, you know, especially a Sager. If you could, because I think Sager makes an educational version. So if yeah. you're not using it commercially, it's it's actually very reasonably priced. Uh, but it, it's got a lot of funky, weird cables that don't seem to fit anything. But I'm sure that if you have, I'm just curious if it would be if you would be willing to make a presentation on you using JTAG effectively. Yeah, sure. I mean, I you know they, I've got. Um... Where's Carl? Carl, you heard that? <laughs> you may have stepped away. You may have stepped away, but yeah, that would be great. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to put it on you, but I do want to put it on you because you're probably the best person to do that for us. You know. Well, I, I found the the um, you know the package I use for Visual Studios, or, or even um, you know the the Cube's not a bad platform. I found. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of of. Um, Eclipse, which is what it's based on, mm -hmm. I find it kind of clunky, and I don't care for their interface. And I really like the Visual Studio, some of the IntelliSense that they have, and yeah. um, you know, the finding all references is something that you you tend to rely on quite a bit, especially when you're going through a big project that someone else wrote, yeah. which is something I find myself doing quite a bit. Um, so it's. And plus, you get it familiar with with the IDE, and you know its quirks and and where to go to get things done. And um, yes. I found it really easy to just figure out how to import because I did a lot of work with you know the the M3 Cortex, the, the NXP platform chips. You know that's what a lot of my robots run off of. Mm -hmm. and, and so now I've I've started porting that into you know the STM um 32 platforms and so that i have some familiarity there with the ide and and with the editor and how things work and how how you set up a load file in it and that sort of thing so it's um it, it tends i think it made it a little easier for me to to port it over mm -hmm. uh, the import wizard they have is pretty nice too because you can just pull in a project from another platform um, and it seems to read it and set it up. So, you know, that may be something to show as well is, is that cross compiler and that plugin. It's fairly reasonable. It's about 150 bucks for a personal license uh, mm. for this plugin. And, um, and then of course you can download visual studio code or community for nothing. Um, and you've got yourself a really powerful IDE yeah. um, that you can support a lot of different platforms and, um, because the the plugin comes with a lot of the cross compiler um, platforms and actually VSPs uh, like for the STMs and and some of the Nucleo boards and and uh, some of the example boards they already have VSPs set up um, just like you're talking about with the cube same mm -hmm. kind of thing where you know all the peripherals are there there's examples of how to set up you know the timers or analog input pins on the nucleos um so it's, it's pretty comprehensive it's pretty pretty well covered the documentation is pretty decent um, yeah but you know nobody reads the documentation they need somebody well, to show it to them scott not not, not unless you're forced to right, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah i know the a lot of the people i think in the in the club use visual uh studio code i think that's I mean, everybody's gone through what I call IDE hell. Otherwise, you use this chip, you have to have this IDE. You use this chip, you have to have this IDE. You use this chip, you have to have this IDE. And they're all being updated all the time. So you're always out of date and you're always, you know, it's just crazy. So that's what I, when I think of Visual Studio Code, that's what I think of it as kind of a unifying IDE and you don't have to worry about well like 
do I have the newest this one and the newest that one and the newest that one? You just have to have you just the problem with Visual Studio Code is they have so many plugins that it's sometimes difficult as a beginner to figure out, okay, look, what do I what do I absolutely need? You know, what is nice to have? And you know, what are this what you know, what are these why are there 5,678 of them? What is there something, you know, is there anything to offer in the majority of them? So yeah, I usually usually handle that by wait until it complains, like, hey, oh God, I don't have this. It's like, okay, well, let me figure out how to get it to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, instead of the the other way around, was like, here, let me just download everything, and hopefully, I'll use yeah, some of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and, and and you know, I, I know what you're saying because even you know, professionally, having half a dozen different IDEs or platforms that okay, so I, I worked on this project ten years ago, and now they want to change it, right? And that was an IDE that I hadn't had on my computer for however long since I did that project. So, yeah. um, and that's yeah. kind of what I was driving at is I'll just take what I do in Visual Studios and I'll just convert that project into that platform instead yeah. of having to maintain all these different IDEs. Um, you know, some of it have its limits like the, the, the microchip stuff, um, they don't have an interface for in the plugin. So you're still stuck with MP lab, but, um, but, you know, most of the platforms, they do a really good job at And like I said, they support even the, the Arduino platform. So they mm -hmm. have Arduino plugins. And yeah. um, it's pretty pretty nice little setup for, for what they charge you for it. Um, it it's really nice. I, I, yeah. I, I but could, you, could, you, could you put a link to, to that particular, you said it was 150 bucks. That's, you know. That, like that. That's what it was, I think, last time I bought it. It's called okay. um, Visual GDB. I oh, let me pull it up. I'll put a chat in here. Yeah. Hey Pat, it was seventy-five degrees here today. Is a record. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> We don't get normally 75 degree weather, but we did today. <laughs> it was about uh, four degrees, maybe uh, <laughs> Celsius here today. Yeah. Okay. So 30, maybe four, maybe 39 degrees or something. Okay. So no okay. new snow. It was no, it was drizzling actually. We made some uh, nice slippery snow ice. Yeah. Mm. All right, the next five days they're calling for just below freezing and snow every day. So a little bit of snow every day. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's supposed to get into the 50s this weekend. Yeah. I would kill for the 50s. <laughs> now, this is Mike Williamson. I'm, I'm new. Oh, and, hi, Mike. Hi. And I really don't know anything. So I was looking at the uh, six can uh, documentation or information. Yes. So I was really curious about this one sentence. It says, competing robots must run autonomously but are not required to be self-contained. What does that mean? Okay. self -con in it, I believe it goes a little later and, and defines self-contained. Self or if it's not in that context, it's, a, it's defined in other contexts. Self-contained means that everything is on the robot. Nothing is not on the robot. If it's not self-contained, that means that you could be running something like ROS over a radio or Wi-Fi, probably Wi-Fi, over Wi-Fi. You know, so you could have a laptop with ROS on it communicating with your robot. That would be okay if it's not allowed, if it's allowed to be not self-contained. How many negatives is that? I don't know, but you understand what I'm saying. So, yeah, like, processing could be on a, on a computer somewhere off off the robot. Right, exactly. Uh, there can't can't be any tethers or anything, but you can have right. a, a, a 
And yeah. once you cut, and by autonomous, we mean that once you start to run, no hands. You know what I mean? Nothing. You can't. Right. Right. You can't influence it. But you could. You you can. Most of the contests allow you to 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 uh, retrieve uh, data. For example, if you wanted to retrieve data for your whole run, you know, maybe speed data or I don't know whatever data you wanted to retrieve. Uh, you can usually retrieve that without any problem, but you can't influence the robot. And by beacon, we mean it, any a beacon is not something with a flashing light on top of it. It's anything that is a navigational aid. All right. So like if you have a flag out there, like what Ray mentioned earlier, what kind of codes were they? Ray, I can't you say. Oh, April text. You know, April tags. You could have an April tag on on both sides to tell you that you were left too far left or too far right. You know, you could do things like that, but that's not legal in most of the the contest. Now, in the case of six can, ta uh, beacons are allowed in a certain portion of the course. They're not allowed behind the goal. And I don't think they're allowed on the side behind the goal either. So anywhere behind the goal, but in something in front of the goal, if you wanted to have again, we and, I, and Ray again, she's you know he's had a red plate and a green plate that he's had held up, well not held up, he's had them like on a stand that helped his robot know. First thing for Ray is knowing which way he's going because Ray has a tendency to go to the wrong way, but and the. <laughs> You're never going to live that one down, right? Uh, but so you can use those to help him with that issue. Because if, he, if his robot's saying, okay, I'm going to the goal, and he doesn't have his flags, he knows he's not really going to the goal. He's going the wrong way. Not that he can do anything about it because it's, you know, it's autonomous. Yeah, so with, with the robot, if the robot has the logic for it, it could turn around. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. I was just curious and about I that. I found out you can't use two orange tags, uh, orange, you know. Yeah, you can't. You can't use anything that would influence the other robot. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't have. Uh, well, like we, what we were talking about earlier, is we had a, you know, a person sitting and standing around who had orange shoes on. Well, you know, from a lot of the robots. They're looking for the color color orange, so they don't care whether it's sky sneakers or whether it's the target. They just head towards the orange. So now, now things are getting a little more complicated because we're getting the sensors have been so great in the last couple of years. I mean, what we had five years ago, even were just much less. Uh, sophisticated than what we have now. We Now we have things that are AI, if you want to use it. We have cameras that can read depth. We have, I mean, and some of the old and goldies are still good, you know? I mean, it's, it doesn't hurt to have an ultrasonic out there. I'm just saying it's, uh, you know, for example, here's something that would be an illegal thing. Uh, if you sat there and had an ultrasonic that you just weren't that you were just pinging all the time just to to set up interference in the uh on the other person's uh ultrasonic that would be illegal and you say well where would you get one of those well it turns out you can there those type of circuits are available uh so you don't want to have something like that now you're obviously if you're using ultrasonic you will be pinging periodically, but uh, that's just normal for that sensor and that's okay. Do I, do, I don't know if that makes sense, but again, I guess it boils down, you can't really do anything to influence the other robot, except when in St. Can Can Soccer, you, you, you can't drive aggressively, otherwise you're there, you, you can't purposely target the other robot to go 
mess them up. But in the course of action, there's almost always going to be a collision unless you've got some sort of really uh, good obstacle avoidance because there you're trying to pick up obstacles. It's not a case of avoidance. You're actually trying to pick up stuff. And if a robot comes in, uh, you know, you're not going to say, okay, whoops, I, this guy over here, I need to turn around on and this guy I need to target. And we've had, you know, some pretty interesting, you know, the two, two robots going for the same can at the same speed and they hit the can at the same time. And it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, well, I think we have, we have rules to try to help with that. Well, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the terms Doug's using is the six can is basically the, 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 the course with six cans and a solo robot. The can can soccer is with two robots on the same course with the same set of cans at the same time. You're right. I was getting those mixed up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. But uh, we try to include robot, you know, for a beginner right now. If you say you did, Mike, are you just starting out? You, have you, do you have a robot at all right yet? I have a little simple spider thing I made. But oh, okay. I need, make, I need to make one with wheels. Okay. Well, no. No. Uh, You know, tackling some of these contests with unconventional robots gets you a lot of uh, gets you a lot of uh, cred points. Okay, like uh, for example, if you were doing a line following robot with your your spider, you know, if it could literally follow the line, you know, that would be that would that would get you a lot of points. So, I mean, not that it, not that you would win, but you would you'd get a lot of uh, a lot. Hey, that's cool points. <laughs> so, so uh, may not win you any contest though. Yeah, so. I know win you any contest, but it and like you saying, getting a, a con. You shouldn't think that uh, you know you have to. We try to to make it so that people can do their thing. The problem is, is some of our guys are really competitive. So they do their things with the sport. They Scott know the Gibson. Best. No, no, Scott's not good. He's, he's not that competitive. He's just good. <laughs> anyway, well, but he's he gives us a good target. I, I, I don't know, Doug. I'm probably one of the bigger trash talkers. Yeah, you are the bigger trash talker. I will give you that. But uh, we're hoping that uh, um, so uh, be able to unseat him from his reign on six can. He's got yeah, a pretty speedy. He does it in about a minute and a half, I believe. I think that was about the time. You can look on our we have on our website. We have what we call the Hall of Hall of Champions or something, something like that, and it it has all of the previous results that we remember to record at the time the contest went on. So, so there are some blanks, but you know we try to get everything we can. And another thing you'll see there, Mike. Is raise a pretty strong second. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't. I don't know about you, Scott, but I haven't. I haven't modified that robot probably in, in five years. So it's the same code that I was running five years ago. Well, that, that explains why you're always coming in second. Yeah, that's why you're still second. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Maybe it's time for an upgrade. Huh? Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, but it, it is interesting. It's kind of like Ron Grant, you know, he brings something in and it's it almost works, but usually not. So yeah, yeah. And then then you never see it again. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It disappears. Yeah. Anyway, and, 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 and to your defense, Ray, I hadn't changed Can Man in probably five or six years either. I just get it off the shelf, charge up the batteries, and blow the dust off. Yeah. You know. Well, I don't I don't usually do that at all. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm still working on mine. I keep keep trying to improve it. So, you know, maybe this will be my year. Let's see. 
So, but but Mike, what I'm trying to say is there's beginner contests, there's uh, and there's intermediate contests, and there's ones that are harder to do for a beginner. Uh, you know, so six cans, there's nothing, no reason why a person can come off and do that, but it probably would be a hard one to do. Okay. I mean, it depends on your background. If you've got a lot of, uh, you know, if you're a good programmer and everything, that's not a problem. But uh, if if you're just trying to learn the skills, that might not be, that might be a next year, or you might even aim for the one we do in the fall, which is where we do an outdoor contest, which is really a, a, a rover type contest. You know, you could think of it like a moon rover if you wanted to, you know, where you actually drive to locations on a course. You have to read the rules. They're, they're more complicated than what I'm saying. But in that case, you know, you would have until November to get it, get it ready. And he wouldn't be under as big a gun. Yeah, I mean, something to think about, you know. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't have him the time to do it. I may. Yeah. But, yeah. But, like close the doors and order food and never leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm just saying it's a, so, you, but they're, they're totally different types of robots. You know, mm -hmm. the indoor robot there tends to be small and fast. And uh, probably the outdoor robots, they can be fast too, but they tend to be bigger and uh, tougher. Usually, you know, they, and they, they have to be able to cover, you know, like potholes and stuff like that. So they're a little bit. Robot uh, animals. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, they're not actually walking, but. Uh, we the problem the other problem like for for a hobbyist is getting a battery battery size to, for a dog type robot uh, uh, might be tough okay uh, <laughs> because I don't think they're very efficient use of the actual motors and everything I'm not saying they aren't cool they are great really cool but. I can imagine it could be pretty heavy with all the battery. All the yeah. Power. Yeah. But, uh, I, I was just saying that's really cool. But that's like a long time. Oh, wait. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And you know, I just, uh, I, I'll be quite honest. I've been thinking about uh, doing another robot build, build, uh, build more robot course here uh, in mm -hmm. the next, maybe in a, probably in the second quarter uh, uh, just because I learn as much from it as when I'm trying to teach it to people. Do you know what I'm saying? And so uh, it might not be as grandiose as some of the ones we've done in the past, but it probably cover, get you going from the, it, it'd be like getting hit, being like a golf ball, you know, you'd be getting hit, get whacked pretty quick and up to speed. So, uh, Anyway, that's something to think about. All right. Uh, who, who, did Carl set up a queue? No, I, I was the only one in the queue. There wasn't a whole lot of. Oh, okay. Doug, I had a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it was just about the contest. So you were going to look at having a contest in May, is it? Yes. Do you do you have a date ironed out yet? We don't have a room reserved. And because I don't have a room reserved, I never like to say we got to it's going to be this. But when we reserve the room, it'll be the second Saturday. Okay? That's the, that's the target is the second Saturday. Second Saturday. Now, it could you know, occasionally like if I couldn't get a room, it might slip to the third Saturday. All right, that could happen. But once we get a room, then we're kind of locked in. Okay, that gives me an idea. Okay. Now I'll start the clock backwards and try to get something ready. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no one else in the queue? Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. Oh, okay. 
Well, I can I can show you one of my uh, thrift store finds if you like. Okay, let's see what you got. Okay, this is a basically an FPV setup. Um, didn't really know whether it was going to work or not, but it was um, very expensive, a dollar ninety nine for the whole thing. Oh wow, that right. Really... Did you get um, your money? Did you get your money's worth? Oh, I definitely did. Anyway, it's got the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the 5.8 gigahertz uh, receiver on it. Um, the display in it works. Um, the receiver works, so it you know, and it's kind of adjustable. It's got straps all over. So this is so this is so that you can see a camera mounted on a robot, or I, I guess it was probably for a drone. Yeah, um, you know, some yeah F FPV setup, but it doesn't. Didn't really say if it was for a drone or what, but I'm assuming for a drone. Yeah, but, might, um, well, what is it? It's it's uh, what's the the I can't remember what the initial stand for. First, oh, uh, first person view. Yeah, first person view. Yeah. Yeah. So what he's talking about is something that goes over. Is put it right. on, you, right? You put it on. Stick this on your head. Okay. And, and it kind of blocks the light out, and you can see what you know the camera on the drone sees. Yeah. And you can, you know, typically you have a, a controller that, you know. Uh, can you, can you, does it have a view down that you could look down and see the controller when you're in, when you got it on? Oh, say that again. Is there like a, like a angle down so that if you had your controller real close to you, you could see it or are you completely blind to your, your controller? Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of you know it fits around your face, so it blocks so light out. Yeah, so you're yeah. blind. Yeah, but yeah, um, I don't know if that'd be sort of like you know uh, patting your nose and chewing gum at the same time. I'm not sure I could handle that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> no, like anyway. fall over or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that was similar to the other piece that I've I've ordered, but hasn't come in yet. And, um, you know, instead of like the, the Oculus where you have two, two um, images that are maybe similar but slightly shifted to give you a 3D effect, um, this one, it's, it's not a split image. So, and I it's can't- It's just a screen, one. right? It's Say just it a screen, just a screen. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and it's got, um, it's got a magnifier so that you can, you can focus. I don't know if I can- so you can see that, but that plate kind of slides up and down with a, it's like a, a pretty large lens on it. That's all the way back and that's all the way forward. So, it, you know, you can actually focus on the image. Wow. But, that's um, really cool. I mean, that's a, that truly is a great find. A buck 98? Oh, 99, but, you oh, know. Wow. Hey. Anyway, I yeah, I don't, I don't, don't find good things like that. Say that again. I never find good things like that. Oh, uh, I rarely do. So yeah. Um, and there, there was a. Um, oh no, it, it is not stereo. Yeah, it's just a you know single view on a like on your cell phone or on um, on a you know an FPV screen that's just showing one image, not two images. Yeah. So how, do, how does it work with glasses at a close distance? Um, it's pretty good. I think um, these glasses are, are made, you know, so that like the focus point is maybe 16 inches away. I think if I got some maybe 2.0 or 3.0, you know, readers from Walmart, so it, it would bring that focus much closer. Um, so it's a, it's a little hard for me to focus on it with these glasses. Uh, and it would be just blurry without them. So, um, so yeah, something that magnifies a little bit more, uh, more, and no, I brings can tell the. You, I got some of the some, they for welder welding helmets. They have some some glasses that little flat. They're readers, but they're just flat. And oh, okay. You that literally clip them into a frame in the in the welding helmet. Yeah, and they really make a difference. So oh, they do. Huh? That might that might be something you want to look at. Yeah, they're not okay. that expensive. They're probably six or seven, six to ten dollars. Okay, um, is it a Fresno lens? No, no, it's no. it's it's like readers, 
except no frame. They're rectangular, and you just yeah. literally pop them, Place into, them inside the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Didn't know they made such a thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that was kind of neat. There's also a uh, a kid's ride on toy for like 16 bucks, but I've got enough junk hanging around so that. Uh, yeah. But it would have made a great little, you know, platform. It had the, oh, I don't know, probably 10 inch wheels on it that were really thick. So they do well on Steve's property. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if it's there this weekend. Usually they mark stuff down. I don't know. You must, be, like, going to, you must be going to one that's not very visited. I don't know. Yeah, it's um, it's the one in uh, McKinney, oh, okay. um, oh, and we, you know, we go grocery shopping every every weekend, and you know, we usually stop by there. And um, there's a furniture consignment store, you know, a couple stores up, and um, you know, we'll we'll take a look through and see what you know discarded furniture looks like and what they have at the you know the thrift store. So. Yeah. But um, yeah, a lot of times there's, you know, nothing that's, in, in my humble opinion, it's crap that nobody needs or would want to buy. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so that was kind of fun, you know. Uh, at the other one, I actually saw it, um, it was a small, um, uh, a small drone. And I was playing around with it in the store and actually got it to fly around in the store. Um, for some reason that day, I thought, yeah, I don't need this either. And, uh, and then the next day I was thinking, you know, I, I should have gotten that just for the controller because it had a really nice, you know, RC controller on it. And uh, went back the next day and sure enough, it was gone. So oh, yeah. something like that. If it worked, it'd be gone. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I got it to fly. So and I've never yeah. flown drones before. So, yeah. But uh, I'm also working. I got um, kind of the next um, version. This is the Max Dot Two, and there are certain things in the kind of the instructions that haven't worked out. Um, one of them is um, I think it's actually used to to program uh, Android phones. Uh, I'd have to look it up, but there's there's some issues with that. You know, you're supposed to just download it and give it, uh, you know, an image file, and it's it's supposed to make it so it's bootable, and it just doesn't work. And so what that's a time? that's a little disappointing. I've got to find. Wait, what are, what are we talking about? Oh, um, this is the this is the Max Doc Two. This is that one. Oh, that's, okay. It's kind of the next generation that, you know, I have the Max.1 and I think you had, you had the Max, uh, Max bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's the one. And this is the two. And it's, it's based on a, I think they call it um, an 831 all winter works at like uh, one and a half gigahertz, I think. Mm -hmm. Much faster, can handle much larger images. at you know uh 60 hertz frame rates and that kind of stuff and mm-hmm. um it's got like the other one it's got a small lcd on the back yeah. um uh this one also came with uh what they called a trumpet which is a speaker i thought that yeah. was kind of funny a trumpet yeah but uh, i guess that's the chinese yeah. translation for speaker or something yeah but, I, mean, uh, I actually dug out my uh, Max Bit and was playing with it today. Oh and yeah, I, yeah. I'm planning on. Uh, I want there. They. I'd like to see if I could actually get it to run an AI model. Okay. So I found some code that looked interesting, and we'll see. I'm mm-hmm. not. I'm not there yet. Okay. I had to refresh my memory on how it all worked. Yeah. Make sure I got everything going. Yeah, and I got that happening. And so, because I'd like to, I really would like to go into base competition with a AI ver, AI type de, can detector as opposed to a blob detector. 
Okay. That's what I would yeah. like. That would be that would be my personal kind of how can I learn something out of this for this year? Mm -hmm. to do. So yeah. yeah, we'll see. And I don't know, I didn't want to use uh, the uh, Oak Delight because uh, I didn't want to screw with a, uh, a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Not on a little indoor robot. You know? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so um, I'm not certain. I know um, McAfee quarantined two of the files. For some reason, I thought they were viruses or something. Mm, that's um, not good. No, it's uh, it's not. But um, um, so I think let's see what what was it? One of them was um, it's the uninstall exe for. Um, for everything, and then the other one is keep um, adb.exe and flag those, and, and both of those files are needed, and they'll they will run until it makes a connection. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't know. Apparently, McAfee saw something wrong with it, so I don't know if it's you know that it actually has viruses. Hopefully, it doesn't, um, yeah. uh, or just McAfee is suspicious and is quarantining them or something. But mm. yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, and when so you're have to... pulling stuff from China, it's always it's always a little iffy. Yeah, the um you know the uh Max Pi um IDE was it's fairly nice. It's similar to, similar enough to um the open and vh7 ide mm -hmm. um you know in fact you can even even bring in open and vh7 examples and and try to run them on it and yeah and in most cases they require minor minor modifications but you can get them to run or at least that's kind of my experience but, yeah mine too. mine too this the max dot uh or the max doc 2 does not have that you know it's it's um I guess you're actually using a Jupyter notebook. Oh yeah. With it, mm -hmm. so, and um, like I said, it's you know, looked at the instructions. A lot of it's in Chinese. Um, in in one of the instructions, um, it tells you to watch the watch a video, and the video is in Chinese, and it's a you know it's like a screenshot, but the stuff is like microscopically small on it, and it's like. You can't, you know, you can't magnify it. You can't blow it up. It's kind of like, oh yeah, that's really useful. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, well, that's one of the things that I've found about uh, seed is they seem to release early, and it takes them a while for their stuff to, to catch up with it. That's yeah, why I they, think things yeah. like the maxi maxi bit and all of those mm -hmm. they've actually gotten pretty slick now. I think. Right, but you know how many years have they been out now? You know, yeah. yeah so I think they rely on the on the community to, you know, yeah, support sure their is. products. And yeah. So, the uh, but it's kind of weird, you know. It's it's like you see these you know companies like SciP producing these products, and it's like okay, why aren't there any manu you know American manufacturers producing these products? I mean, you know. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, you just don't see of, it. No, What's that? I, I agree with you. And it, it, they're, they're, they're potentially very, very good products. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you wonder, you know, like, you know, we're, we're, are we losing it? I mean, are our American entrepreneurs not just, uh, or is there just no money in it? I don't know. That's probably it. Or, yeah. takes a lot more to develop it here than it does over there. Yeah. So. I, I look at that where you got the max bit uh, camera uh, board that the Ray demonstrated. Yeah. And you look at the OpenMV, which I believe was uh, designed in the U.S. Yeah. And, and look at, you know, they're very similar properties to the two, mm -hmm. but look at the cost difference. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but one one of them does come with a lot of documentation, examples, everything, mm -hmm. um, and then the other one seems to have ripped off some of the software. 
Yeah. Yeah, very similar. Not identical, but very similar, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's it's the difference of, you know, let's say $70 US for that camera, one mm -hmm. versus the other. Yeah, yeah, maybe 20 bucks for, you know, the Max Dot or yeah. Max Dock. Yeah, 20 or 30 bucks or whatever it is. And then the other one is you know, close to 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, even I, I know there was, um, he was, uh, affected by chip shortages too. And for a while there, he just, you know, he couldn't produce them. So, uh, yeah, you know, that's one of the things that's going to be really interesting. You know, nobody's could, nobody's been able to get hold of Pi 4 for a couple of years now. Mm. You know, and you wonder, you know, I saw, I'm starting to see some videos where people are starting to recommend alternative boards because you can get them. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious uh, what what's going to happen when you can get Pi 4s again. Are they going to be like, oh, sorry, we've moved on? Or is it going to be something that as soon as they make them available, or everybody goes back? And we'll see. I think the prices are going to, you know, the alternative boards, the prices are still in the $100 US range. Yeah. And I think the prices are going to have to drop. It's hard to compete with a, you know, a $35 or $40 US uh, single board PC that mm -hmm. does a very good job for uh, for that price range. Mm -hmm. And I thought he, he announced um, the Raspberry Pi uh, 5 too, didn't he? No, I think they, if I remember right, they said that it wouldn't be out till 2024. 24, but yeah, yeah. they've, I guess they're working on one. So yeah. I don't know. I'm if that's sure the, they are. Yeah. Raspberry Pi 4 is the last half of the year, I believe, 2023. Yeah. And they're working on the nanos and the RP 2040s and whatever right now. And then 2024, apparently they're going to be uh, releasing a Raspberry Pi 5. Mm -hmm. that's everything I've read mm -hmm. I'm still looking for I don't want to disassemble a robot to build another robot yeah I know what you mean. I got yeah. two Raspberry Pi 4s I'm looking for a third to uh, well uh, one trick is to, to make them where they're easy to put in and out you know what I mean Velcro them to the to the base plate you know so that you don't end up that, that you can take it out if you have to so and just have different That's a very good SD idea. cards. And just have different SD cards, you know. Uh, and also trying to repurpose some of the, you know, I've got several three three Bs that once I got a four, I never wanted to use them again. So I'd I'd like to find uses for those because uh, you know, other than being slower, they're still not bad. You know, they just not as good. Anyway, and now that I've got figured out how to do non fan cases, I've on the four, I feel good with, about that too. Uh, I don't have to worry about overstressing them. So I just bought the case, the, the two sh you showed, Doug. Yeah. I, I bought. The lesser model case that you were showing. Yeah, yeah, the one that looks. I've got, I've got, uh, I think I've got one over here. That's this is, this is a, an Amazon uh, refurb or whatever, and it, so you get what they have, you know. And I think this is the same case that you're talking about, except this one's not. Uh, it's not black. It's not anodized. Is yours? The, they make two. They make the absolute cheapest. Just as this piece, yeah. just as the top piece, that's the absolute cheapest. And then the next one that's a, a dollar or two more has the bottom plate. I guess okay. like this. That's what I have is the top and the bottom plate with the three uh, heat sink pads on it. Yeah. The other thing I've been working on or I'm thinking about working on is I got one of these little graphic LCD displays. Mm -hmm. 128 by 64 and for lack of a decent remote control that has decent positioning joysticks that you know don't have a bunch of dead spots in them 
I'm looking to build my own little remote control using the uh, little uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, wireless transmitters. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking to send information back and forth. I was inspired by Ray's presentation. Mm -hmm. And looking to send some info back to uh, the little LCD screen so you can get some feedback. Yeah. You know, direction, distance, whatever else you're looking at. Well, I got to admit, I, that board that Ray talked about last week, I went ahead and bought one. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> well, you know, who knows? We Maybe we can come up with, a, you know, if enough people are interested, we can, that's a, a ESP32 solution. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's touch screen. Uh, yeah, capacitive touch too. Yeah, it's about and with shipping and everything, it was right at twenty dollars, I think. So hard to resist. It's a it's yeah. another Chris Nutter special. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I found one that's maybe not quite as as capable, but it does have a capacitive touch screen that's two and a half inches, uh, mm. with the uh, SB thirty two. That's only ten dollars. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, be, to be quite honest, you know, they have the resistive touch, which is a couple of dollars cheaper. And I just bought it from the same place Ray bought it because he actually got his. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's, you know, there's some AliExpress places that you can get it for half price. You know, I don't know. It might be half there, but you know, mm -hmm. so. Uh, but if you got it, you know, that's a, that's, that's what you want. You want to make sure you get it. Oh yeah. 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 I just, I finally got credited, uh, from Banggood. Um, uh, they were like two, well, I don't know, pretty much two thirds of the order was missing. Um, you know, the bag, it looked like, you know, it was it was taped up back up with clear tape. Yeah. And you know, the back side of it kind of, you know, didn't look much different than this. It, you know, it was obviously either cut into or got stuck in a conveyor belt somewhere or something. And the stuff just got like peeled out of it. Uh um, the base unit for the battery charger was in there, but there were no cables, no box, no instructions. Um, the second and third uh items in the order weren't there, you know. So this this just shows up kind of looking like this. And uh, I was, you know, like I said, I finally got my, my refund back from Banga today and it was ordered uh, in early December. So, But Banga has always been pretty good. For, I mean, I've never had trouble with Banga. They're not as cheap as AliExpress. Yeah. Yeah. And but, it seems uh, like they're carrying less stuff too. Yeah. I don't yes, know. If, less new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I follow that too. Yeah. I don't know if they're having financial troubles or what. Yeah. I don't know. But but quality wise, I, know, I mean, everything I ordered from Bangor, I always got. Mm -hmm. Yeah. AliExpress lately, it's been about 50% of what you order actually gets shipped. Really? It's really? Horrible. Wow. Yeah. At least to hear. It's. Yeah. Mm. And nothing now is under two months. Wow. Oh, order it. And then, you know, they, they heave it into a, to a shipping container, a sea can, and off it goes, you know, in a month or whatever when the sea can is full. Yeah. Well, they have two on Al AliExpress has two levels of shipping for us here in the States. And the difference between the shipping is is very small it's like two dollars yeah. And, yeah and uh the one of them tries to give you will give you a uh, two weeks they'll get they say they'll get it to you in two weeks and then the other one's usually three weeks or more yeah does so, the better one have tracking probably the the uh, cheaper one doesn't right probably yeah, but, so, yeah so, so they might have Canada. so they might have two containers pat you know, one which they throw it in and when it fills up and then maybe they have a smaller container that they throw it in and then once a week it goes out. Uh, who knows? You know, yeah. second second option in Canada usually is less than 20, 27 days or less, yeah. like 14 to 27 days. Oh, OK. And I, I've always paid the couple bucks extra to try to get that service. Yeah. And I'm six to eight weeks out typically. 
Oh, wow. if, if they ship it. So now typically you're waiting, whatever it is, they're 59 days or something before you can claim it as not shipped or not received. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know, at times I think it's just a game. They create a, sh a shipping number, tracking number. And when you look it up, tracking number was created, but nothing ever got picked up. Yeah, you see that. And, and you got a no record of it, yeah. Yeah, I just got a Kickstarter. I just, well, I didn't get it yet, but I just did a Kickstarter. And uh, they uh, they did exactly what you're saying, Pat. They, they, they printed, quote, printed a tag. And so on the tracking sheet, it shows when they printed the tag. And the first stop, the first place, you know, like it now has gone into the system was a, was a week and a half later. So, mm -hmm. so, so I, I bought my wife a tablet uh, at Christmas. She, her old one was way too slow. So I bought her a new uh, tablet. So I ordered uh, from Lenovo. Yeah. And so one of their decent tablets. Yeah, it made it from the U.S. shipping to the Canadian uh, border inspection or wherever where the products come into the country and got lost. So I think so, somebody needed a Christmas present more than my wife did. Yeah. And, and dealing, dealing with Lenovo on a, a product that's missing or dealing with UPS on shipping is horrible. Mm. I had to, I, I had to threaten finally the chat lady at Lenovo that if I didn't get a resolution or at least some movement on this, that I was calling my credit card company and canceling the order for, for mm -hmm. uh, shipment. Mm -hmm. And it was the only way I got them on their end to actually do something. It arrived after Christmas, but at least it got here. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think in a lot of cases, the, they just don't update the records or, you know, it's it doesn't like filter back to you until two weeks later. So um, yeah. you know, it's, like, it's funny with FedEx, it's, I've never gone wrong shipping anything internationally from, you know, from the U.S. to Canada. I call a broker, get FedEx International, and it's here the next two days later. I've got it yeah. in my hand, mm -hmm. you know, for industry. And yeah, you're paying a premium for shipping and the service, but you get it. Right. I've, I've done the same using UPS and it's been lost. You know, three weeks later, you're behind on a project and you're, you're still waiting for parts. Yeah. Mm. And it's horrible. Yeah, but I think the glory days of buying stuff from Chinese China for hobbyists like us is kind of gone, is past. I mean, I, I remember, you know, pre-COVID and before the the US, U.S. Coastal Service changed their rules. We would get, you know, we could, we, you couldn't even buy the, uh, the parts for what you were buying to get it. You know, it was so cheap and there was no shipping costs. It was incredible. And uh, those days are gone. You don't see that anymore. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that most of the stuff you're getting out of China, whether it's AliExpress or uh, Alibaba or whatever it is, Banggood, it's all seconds. There's a reason they're cheap. They're falling off the line as second quality. There's bad solder joints. There's misalignment. Mm -hmm. There's whatever on them. Mm, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I, yeah. I've had several what I'd call good, good purchases from all of those places. Uh, yeah, you know, I think no, that most of our the motors that we got for our uh, yeah uh, build, I think they were second. They were probably seconds. Yes. Yeah. When, uh, several years ago, we had a club robot build, and we bought a large quantity of inexpensive motors from China. Uh, and I don't know about the other guys, but I ended up totally replacing them with uh, Polo Lu motors uh, of the same size because it just the difference was. Uh, uh, I know uh, Dave had I think two that didn't work, and I think I had four and one of them didn't work. So it was just you know that just wasn't wasn't really. And the thing that was strange about it was. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I, I guess you get what you pay for. 
you know, I have had other motors from China work very well. So, mm -hmm. but that yeah, time, me too. But that time, it, that was a disaster. Yeah, I, I think what uh, those were 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 seconds that didn't pass, mm -hmm. and uh, by replacing the hall sensors, they we uh, Doug and I got them to work. Yeah. Yeah. So it was the encoders that didn't work. The motor spun. Well, there were two problems. Uh, two problems. Uh, uh, they had some. I think Dave actually had one where the Hall effect sensor was soldered on backwards. Oops. You know, it was it was flipped, so that didn't work. And they they were soldered in a way that there was no adjustment to it. Otherwise, if you see on, on some of them, there would be the, the leads that came from the hall sensor were long. Well, what that buys you is that you can take your pliers and you can tweak in the quadrature, okay? Where what they would happen on these ones that we got, they, they put it right up against the board and soldered it. So there was no tweak in that at all. And uh, also the board had to go right up against the, 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 the uh, magnet because she didn't have the space, you know? So, but like, if you look at these yellow motors that we've been, a lot of people have bought that have the encoders on it, you'll see that they're not really the, the leads from the from the uh, uh, hall effects factors are actually pretty long, and that just allows you to you know like let's say you're getting uh, a 60 degree quadrature, you can just bend it a little bit and you get it back up to 90. Or you can go like Polo where they have all of the all both of the sensors in one package, and you automatically if you got the right if you've got the right magnet. And you're using that one. You got a they're spaced exactly right, so you'll always get 90 degrees, and they're all very pretty. Or you know, you pull out one of those polo loop motors, and you you put it up on an oscilloscope, and it it looks textbook. Hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, about the only thing that I've had fail recently was um, one of the batteries that I got from Banggood. Um, one of the cells on it, it was a four cell uh, lithium ion. And one of the cells just went like dead short. Well, so. you know, I will say one thing on this, something that uh, you might want to consider. Uh, you know, Amazon now is carrying a lot of, of, uh, a lot of RC batteries. And hmm. they're, they're really pretty reasonably priced. Uh, you have to take things with a little bit of salt. I've been I've been getting. Uh, let me show you these. I've been getting things like this. This one is a hard case, and it says it's sixty one hundred. You can see it here big, again. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is just a, a two S. So it's a 7.4 volt, mm -hmm. and uh, that was what I've been using in the other one. And I think it was about 20 bucks. And uh, so I took it out, and I, you know, I did all my testing on it. And it, 61 is a stretch, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, you know, it's about 55, 5600. Mm. So, but that's what, if you look at some of the other batteries, you know, 5,600 is kind of what they claim. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise the 61 is a little over claim. But, but life, wow, very nice. Uh, I put it in my robot, and I got 20 minutes of running full out on it, and that was really nice. Mm -hmm. And then for my little indoor robots, I picked up some of these 1,600 shorty batteries. Andy. And these are three S, and again they were, you know, I think these were about eighteen dollars or something like that. Uh, and uh, 
when I tested those, they came out at 1500. So they're also a little short, but now, in fact, I'm beginning to wonder if my, uh, maybe the problem's not the battery, but it might be my battery charger, you know, it might not be accurately telling because I'm always short a little bit. Yeah. But, but right at this point, I'm going to claim it's the batteries. Uh, but, you know, nice silicon leads. I mean, this, these are silicon wire, even out, even on the, on the balancing cable. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not. Yeah, this is, that's, that's the one that had the one bad cell. It's Zara yeah. Power. Yeah. Um, which seemed to be pretty reputable, but um, you know, yeah, fairly nice construction, but yeah, the last, the last cell in the chain of, of four of them is, like I said, a dead short. And um, so now I have a, a 3S battery that I got refunded for. So, you know. Yeah. Well, here's something else that now I'm not saying they can't fake this, but it probably wouldn't because it's a Chinese company. If it, if, if you're using the XT 60s, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're actually made, there's a company that originated that called uh, AMAS. And these are actually a mass connectors. So those are, that's, you know, that's, that's good. You know, and uh, so I, the actual construction of these bodies of these two, two different batteries is actually pretty good. And the price is not, the performance is good and the price isn't that, that bad. So Amazon as a source for this type of battery is not bad. It's just to make sure you read the read the uh, reviews because uh, they're not all created equal. Oh yeah, so, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I had several several of the Zop brand, and they've done well. You know, they hold their charge. I, I didn't really test them for capacity, but yeah. they kind of beat my expectation for you know how long they'd stay up and. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, the ones I the, the the ones I've been getting are from a company called Hilldown, H I L L D O W. Hmm. So you know, anyway, hmm. something to think about. I don't know what you normally pay. What did you pay for that one, Ray? Uh, well, I was. Really wanting two of them, um, they were forty each. But okay. I noticed that they went on sale enough. for like twenty six shortly after that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, are they are they are they three or four sale? I, I didn't catch. It's they're it's actually cell. a four cell, but one of the cells went bad, and I've I've got three of these. Okay, and right. this is the only one that screwed up. Yeah. yeah, I don't know about a four. I I don't use four S batteries, so I'm not sure what they cost. But yeah, you can you, you can find out. I'm sure. I use two and three cells, three mm -hmm. S's. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually going to take um, well this one that is now a three S and another three S and um, make a six S. Uh, you know, well, and I'm, I'm going to do it in in series and oh. um, because those the motors on the outdoor robot actually work on 22 volts, so. You know, that's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. For a while there, I was, uh, I would, you know, I have a um, slate tile and, you know, some parts of the house. And I was, after it went to a short, I was, I would, every night I would stick it out in the middle of nowhere on the tile in the hallway. And, you know, just in case it decided to flare out or something, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those things. Uh, you had multiple batteries do the same thing? No, just this one. Oh, okay. All right. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, I didn't trust it after, you know, it went short. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, on my charger, it has a, dis a discharge thing. Mm -hmm. And it takes it down a little bit too, too low. It takes it all the way to three volts. 
Hmm. And I don't think I have an adjustment to adjust that. I wouldn't normally take these cells down to three volts. I'd take them down to three, two. And anyway, going all the way down to three volts, one of the things I, I you know, so I know when I say it's low, it's a little bit low because I'm getting the full charge. But uh, I, if you look at a, a lithium ion cell, cell curve, it goes like, you know, down, and then all of a sudden it goes whoop, like that. Well, when you discharge them that deeply, some of the cells will be down here, and some of the cells will be up here. Do you know what I'm saying? So, that's, that's so, right. you, you, so you're, yeah, depending on where they're, where, what they're in, which one discharged more slightly. So your balance is really nasty looking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, uh, I'm still trying to make sure I understand all the ramifications of that. Uh, but the answer to it is you never discharge anything down that low. You, can, you probably stop it at 25% mm -hmm. and then recharge it. Yeah, I think even Tesla recommends like, you know, uh, I think stay stay between eighty and twenty. Never fully charge them or fully discharge them. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I don't have an electric car, but I did. Have, I have a friend who has one, and they said that they basically told them to only use eighty percent of the battery. Mm -hmm. So you know, I guess if you were on a big trip, you'd probably charge it all the way. But if you're just using yeah. your own house, yeah, Carl so. could probably tell us that. And they also said. Um, you know, too many superchargers would definitely limit the number of cycles on your battery. So, you know, yeah, you may be able to charge quick and get the car and go, but <laughs> yeah. I guess you're not as good. Well, I think battery. the real thing is, is being up where Pat is, you know, I, I learned, okay, I got a solar cell that I got for a trail camera and it has a lithium ion backup in the solar cell. So the idea is you don't have to put any batteries in the trail camera, okay? So I was, you know, was doing a lot of research on, well, like, because I was looking at the, looking at the, I was looking at all of the ratings and some of them would say, oh, this is a piece of crap, you know, oh, 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 it was horrible. And other guys were saying, well, it's great, you know? And then it dawned on me as I kept reading into the specifications of lithium diet, do you know that if you're lithium, you have a lithium battery and it reaches the temperature of 32 degrees C, I mean, 32, degree, 32 degrees F or zero degrees C, it stops charging. It doesn't mm -hmm. charge anymore, but it continues to discharge. So like if you got it in use, it'll continue to discharge, but it, no matter what you do, it's not going to charge back up. Hmm. And uh, so the, in this case, even though the solar cell might be saying, here you go, here's a bunch of good stuff, the cell itself won't, won't charge. Hmm. And it gets even worse as the temperature goes back. So, so anybody who's using one of these solar cells up where Pat is, it's not going to last through the winter because you're just going to be running that cell down into the mud all the time. Yeah, if you want, if you want something to work in, in the winter, it's it's not lithium ion in the cold here. It's uh, you know nic nicad or nickel metal hydride or lead acid. Yeah, all of those will work. Yeah, that's that's what I found out, and uh, that's why they were getting these nasty, you know, these this real split in opinion on the on the solar cells, because you know half of them were up from up north and half of them from the south. And the winds in the south were going like, ah, this is okay, no problem at all. You know, I've had it for two years, three years, you know, no problem. And the guy up north is saying, you know, it lasted a month and then was piece, you know, garbage. So it's really interesting. Yeah. Well, not only that, the this, you know, what do they call it? Uh, solar insulation. Um, much better down here in the south than it is at Canada, I mean, what do you have to set there, like your arrays to like 45 degrees or something? Where right now? Yeah, like at your, your latitude. Oh, God, it would be 
uh, yeah, 45 degrees, like uh, at the best. Oh, so really? Even, yeah. Hmm. So in the summer, it's uh, yeah, it's quite a, quite a ways out. It's uh, but in the winter, I think it's a 23 degree difference between summer and winter. Well, hmm. So yeah, so I right. set mine at uh, at 30, and that's that's great for two days of the year. You know, the summer solstice and the winter solstice. Any other time, it's it's not perfect. You know, it's off a little. Yeah, but you're, you're a lot time. closer to the okay with one setting than we are. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Ray, I heard you asking, asking about, about Tesla. Tesla. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, I kind of shift the side. side. So, so uh, basically, uh, basically uh, yeah, yeah. So on, on, on my wife's, wife's car, car um, we normally, normally don't, don't charge it more than seventy-five percent, and we don't, we don't do discharge it more than twenty percent. Mm. Almost, Almost usually, it gets down around 30 or 35, and especially, and especially if she has to drive a long way the next day, day especially, especially if it's going to be really hot or it has to run the air conditioning and keep itself cool, then uh, it'll, it'll get charged up to 75. But the funny thing happens is, and I think this is related, my understanding is that it's related to the battery chemistry, and that is that uh, if you look at the charging profile for lithium ion, when it's, when it's nearly, nearly discharged, discharged um, or really, really low, low uh, it, charges it charges with a constant current, current profile. profile. Mm -hmm. So, so it'll, 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 it'll pump lots, lots and lots, of, you know, as many amp hours, hours as it amps, amps into it at a time. Mm -hmm. But when it starts to get towards full, the charger, the charger will, will change over to a constant voltage, voltage profile. profile. Mm -hmm. And whenever you do that, what happens is that the... Um, the ability, the ability to, to pump high amps, amps decreases. decreases. So that's, so that's why, why as your battery starts, your lithium ion battery, battery starts to get full, it slows down. It doesn't charge as fast. So that it's like asymptotic. So as you get closer and closer, closer, closer to full, full, it takes longer and longer to charge. So one of the tricks that people do on the highway is that even with the superchargers, I mean, they'll do the... And I think they have a rating now, a setting now where in 20 minutes you can bring your car pretty much to 80%. So let's just charge it to 80% at the supercharger, take on, and the software and the dashboard knows how to plan the next stop so that uh, you don't run out before you get a charge. And then you pull over, you do another 20 minutes, get it back up to 80%. So it's not like you necessarily even need to charge it all the way to 100%. Mm -hmm. So what is... 75 to 25 percent what is what's your hours i mean how many miles you get does that give you Carl? i have to ask my wife i don't know it it, it really depends on the weather like in the last couple of weeks when it hasn't been too cold it hasn't been too hot she can get from our house to medical city which is 15 miles each way so 30 mile day and that'll cost for less than 10 percent of the battery so call it seven kilowatt hours all right all right so 30 mile Seven, seven kilowatt, kilowatt hours per 30, 30 miles, whatever that is. Okay. So um, let's just do the math because I mean, we're here, we're engineer backgrounds, right? So 7,000 7, uh, kilowatts divided by 30. So it's about 233 kilowatt hours per mile. <laughs> Not gallons per mile, but kilowatt hours per mile, right? And you can probably back that into joules if you wanted. But so, um, but you know, in the summer, like, like there was a super, super stretch, stretch of super hot days. days. Well, she had to drive all the way from um, between Carrollton and Louisville to Rockwell in traffic, and then had to sit in an open parking lot instead of a covered garage when the temperature was 102 outside and the sun was beating down on it. And she would leave, I, I could swear there was a couple days, that's like 50 or 60 miles round trip. And, and there, there was, was a couple, couple days when she left at 75% and got back at 20. Mm. But, but it's sitting there, there in the parking lot for eight or 10 hours in the sun. It's, it's running the air conditioner to keep the cabin below 95 Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. And it's doing whatever it has to do to keep the battery pack at whatever temperature it needs to keep the battery pack at. So it burns energy to keep itself cool. And I believe it does the same thing in the cold weather. 
burns Burn energy, energy to keep itself warm. warm. <laughs> so are you saying 7,000 kilowatts or seven kilowatts? Seven, 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 seven kilowatts. kilowatts. I'm, 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 I was just doing some quick math and saying, well, that trip cost her $1,600. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, um, a full, a full charge on that car, I believe, is about 75 kilowatt hours. Okay. That, so that makes more sense. So that trip is, that is seven, right? That trip is under a couple dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, for if you're paying roughly with all your your metering charge and everything else, that's like a dollar sixty. Yeah. Yeah. For, 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 for the energy. energy. Yeah. 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 So, so it's, 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 it's good, good in that regard. regard. Okay. okay so, so the other funny thing, thing there's, there's a, uh, there's, there's a funny, funny uh, uh, there's a funny side, side effect to the, the um, cold, cold weather charging, charging of lithiums that surfaces in this car. And um, it, it has to do with regenerative braking, braking right? Because you think about regenerative brakes. brakes. If you hit the brakes and, and it's regenerative, where does the energy go? Back, back in the battery. 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 But what, what happens if the battery is too cold or it's too cold outside? Oh, yeah. Energy is not going in the battery. So now, so now how do you, how do you stop? stop? Well, you well, still have to have physical, physical heat, 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 heat generating metal, metal and metal brakes, metal and whatever, whatever brakes. So, so, uh, so there's, there's now, now, I think with the latest update, update that came in, she, she was mentioning that there's now a setting where, where and it used to be really weird, weird because um, we, 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 we tried just for grins once or twice to charge it up all the way, or we did that before we found the don't charge past setting. And, uh, Whenever, Whenever it's fully charged, charged the braking, braking is really, really it feels soft compared to normal. Hmm. It, feels it feels soft compared to normal. Compared to normal. So, so with this latest software update, they've added, added a setting. setting so now um, you, can, you, can, you can mimic regenerative braking even when, there, when, when it's cold, cold. When, when regenerative braking doesn't work. work. So, so I think what they've done is they've like hacked in the response curve from the brake pedal to the stopping force. So they've, so they've, they've hacked, hacked that, that in to like, like uh, make, make the brake pedals, pedals, the mechanical ones, more, more mimic the transfer curve of the regenerative brakes. So Carl, on the Tesla, does that mean that the brakes are by wire? It brakes by wire? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the time, it's I think it's by wire. I mean, I don't even know if you can tell as a mere mortal when the physical brakes are engaged or not. But, mm -hmm. but normally along the top of the, the, the dashboard, there's this really thin, thin little line. line. I mean, it can't be more than three or four pixels thick. And right in the, right in the middle, middle, you're not sucking, sucking any energy and you're not pulling any energy, in the, energy in the battery. When you hit, when you hit the gas, the gas I mean, they, they call it the go pedal. But when you hit the juice to dip forward, it goes black by a lot. When you ease up and you coast, it kind of backs you off go downhill or you go downhill or you come up to a stop down. and you need to slow down take your foot off the juice pedal, just take your foot off the juice the pedal green. it goes into the green and that's battery. how you know when it's filling the battery back up so yeah. when you get cold weather and your regenerative braking isn't working well do you get into uh, an over voltage situation i don't know who knows, I don't how, know. Who knows how it handles I mean, it i mean you've got to imagine, got to imagine that there's uh, uh there's all kinds there's all kinds of protection mechanisms, mechanisms in there, there. But, and you'll, you, and you'll you even hear it. Really so it's really funky. It's really funky, it's really a funky kind of beast because you go out in the garage and, um, and um, it's got, it's got cameras, and cameras and stuff. It knows, it knows when, you when you approach it, and all of a sudden you start to hear this clicking inside, inside under the hood. And you, and you, and you like, and you, like you, you, uh, you, uh, you, you, you push, push the button, button to open the, open the charging bay, bay and you hear and some more clicking. So I think there's all kinds of contactors and relays and whatnot going on in there, and fans whirring and. It's just, it's crazy. just crazy. Who knows, Who knows what's going on under the hood? But it's it's a it's a noisy, it's a noisy little, little thing if you're in a quiet area, area and you pay attention. Just as long as when you're in it, you know, and, and you ask it to unlock the door, it says, "I'm sorry, Carl, I can't do that." Yeah, which is um, yeah, which is um, <laughs> that's happened. That's that's not terribly common, terribly common but, but it's, happened. it has happened. So there's so there's, there's, there's some things I read last year or so where. Um, Okay, it's not okay, uncommon, it's not uncommon the for the software crash. crash. And apparently, and apparently, there's, there's like, the, like the driving system is separated, is separated from, from all the fancy schmancy system. So, so um, and my brother-in-law's brother done this. I don't think my wife has, but uh, but, apparently but apparently, it's it's normally possible to reboot, reboot the computer, the computer while, while it's driving. 
you're driving, so you're driving down, down the road, road and you push the key strokes, strokes and suddenly, suddenly your dashboard, your dashboard goes, goes blank and it reboots, and it reboots itself, itself but you're still able to control it even though it's all by wire. But then there's, but then there's also this case where at some point, point I remember what happened. What happened? The Did the car pull itself off the side of the road or it just stopped? But anyhow, the guy got stuck inside his car on the side of the road. And what, and what powers the doors? The, doors? Battery. the battery. And the computer. And, the computer. and, it, wasn't and it wasn't responding. Wasn't responding. He, he couldn't get out. Get out. So he sat in his, his car for like two or three hours until he could figure out how to get out or someone smashed the windows to let him out. Yike. Yes. So there's a release in the passenger seat buried somewhere if you know where to look. That you can, uh, there's a mechanical release so you can let yourself out if you want to. But that, I kept, I kept seeing examples of that, and I went ahead and bought some of those little uh, glass break or seatbelt cutter things. So we have those in each of our vehicles now, especially the Tesla. So the the business with the regenerative braking, I'm I'm assuming they did that so the driver doesn't sense like a difference in the braking or like to say that, you know, the, the braking feels spongy today or soft or. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, when I, when I, don't, I don't drive it that much. much. I happened to drive it uh, one, one time when it was fully charged. charged and I thought, what is wrong, wrong with this? Because it, I mean, I mean, it, it really, really sets, sets you back. back. I mean, there's, there's something when you're, when you're used to driving a car and it behaves the same way decade after decade, right? Yeah. To have something brand new suddenly change on you. For, for no no, no reason. reason. I mean, it's it's, it's disconcerting. Oh yeah, um, yeah. So Especially with braking. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> they uh, no. If they can only fix the glitch where, where this, well, this, this one seems to be really common. common. Uh, Terry's seen, seen it. I've seen, seen it. it. My brother-in-law's seen, seen it. There's plenty of blogs and videos on it. But for whatever reason, you put it on full self-driving beta. It's driving down the highway. And who knows if it sees something or it just gets confused? It decides to slow down and pull over. And that, and that happened. happened. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It'll, it'll just slow, slow down. down. And you, if, if, if you're paying attention, like you should, you go, well, come on. on. Just and, and then you start, start, you keep driving. driving. You don't let it do that. But uh, from there was that uh, pile up over New Year's, New Year's on uh, in, a, in the one bridge in San Francisco. Well, well they had some video from a security camera. So I never read the follow through on this, but the presumption was that. It, it was in full self-driving self beta, and it pulled itself over to inside, inside this tunnel, tunnel on the fast lane. lane. And, and the next, next thing, thing you know, there's seven cars, cars like piled on top of it because they pulled over, over right? right? And and, uh, and, and so, so of course the brouhaha was all because it's a Tesla, and uh, uh, just a little bit about you know people that are riding inches off of the car in front and not paying attention. But okay, aside from that. And, and because, because the Tesla, Tesla it slowed, you could see from the video, it, it brought itself to a nice gradual stop. stop. I, mean, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was what you would do if you had, some, like, like if your car started, started to fail and you needed to pull over. Your, your alternator went or something. You, you, you lost your, you lost, lost your spark plugs. I mean, you're going to pull over. And that, and that was the, that was what the car did. But it happened to do that on the bridge in front of the security camera. And literally there was a couple of cars piled on top of each other. Because it was in the middle of the rush hour. hour. So, so it'll be interesting, interesting to find, find that follow up, see what happened once it's detangled. detangled but mm. it's don't, show about that. That. don't show that to David Anderson, please. Why not? That's right. I mean, I mean you know, you know okay, okay, so, so how, I mean, how, How many cars, cars on the road, road have a black box, box right? Mm. I mean, and, and, and he needs to have a black box. He has to have a black box. So, you talk about the braking situation, and the um, I, I guess that was adequate or considered adequate back then, but in in 1965. Um, uh, the Chevy trucks they had, you know, it was a brake cylinder that was smaller than my fist and it has, it had just one line hydraulic line coming off it. So if any of the, the four wheel cylinders failed or leaked so much fluid that, you know, you actually got air in the master cylinder, you would have no brakes. Yeah. So, um, 
you know, I think after that they went to, you know, two lines, you know, for your front wheels and for your back wheels. But um, yeah, I've gotten in situations where, you know, I needed to stop quick in traffic and the thing and it's, it's manual brakes. It's not even, you know, there's no vacuum booster or anything. And, you know, find myself using both feet to press on the brake pedal to try to get the thing to stop, you know, (laughs) but uh, yeah, I can, I can see why. And I, I I don't know, you might want to look on what that Mercedes has got. I'm assuming it's got like two lines, you know, two separate lines from. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, it's just got one. It's It's got got one line line feeding the whole whole system. system. And and, uh, and then the the handbrake is cable cable actuated to the two rear wheels. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was pretty common. So, so I, yeah, the handbrake, yeah. So, so I, I do have that, that but, but if they're drum brakes, not this. Disc. Yeah. And, and it, it uses, uses uh, when it works, works, it uses a power, power booster. This, this is a 57 Mercedes, by the way, guys, a 190 SL that I'm going to restore. And, but it has a power booster that uh, is supposed to add like 50% to your braking pedal force. Force, yeah. Um, um, but this, you know, 50s cars, cars they worked with materials materials, materials they had in the day, day especially post war. And this, this thing, so it has um, apparently this is the hardest uh, parts. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the, the, it's one of the few parts, parts in the thing, thing that you can't get spares of these days because there's a seal in the brake booster on on some of the axles in there that were leather. Oh God, yeah, they were leather. Yeah, so those you get replaced with rubber these days. And, and then, then in the, the air cleaner, cleaner um, the air cleaner was actually horse hair. hair. And, and you wouldn't replace it. You'd, you'd rinse it with gasoline, spray it out, put a couple drops of oil, and back on the air duct it goes. I yeah. remember I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> they used to have um it wasn't actually like a paper element, it was like a, a fine screen that you would coat with oil. Mm-hmm. And that was another common thing so uh, you know <laughs> i don't know how much how fine of a particle it would let through that screen but you know I, I think the hope was that it would catch on the oil and knock it in your engine and the, and the oil, oil filter, filter was never replaced. replaced you just again you pull, pull it out it rinse it out, out put it back on the car, car. seriously oh, yeah. seriously yeah, yeah. so, the, so club, the club has adapters now so you can use water. modern Modern, modern oil, oil filters, filters and, and there's a company that makes uh, air, filters air filters that fit. You just have, you just to, have to get the grinder to take, take out the horse hair. <laughs> wow. Guys, I'm going to have to go. All right, guys. Um, we'll see you guys. Hey, Doug, hey, Doug uh, uh, I'm going to be on travel for a couple, couple weeks. weeks. Can, Can you kind of like help, help and run, run things? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I won't guarantee the videos will come out white, but I'll try. Well, that's all right. Lately, 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 mine haven't been coming out so well either, but um, um, thank, thank you. you. I'll, I'll send more information later. later but, uh, okay. All right. Okay, okay guys. guys. Is, Bye. Anyone else want to stay on chat, or are we going to call it a night? Good night. <laughs> all right. All right. Take care. Take care.